Welcome again, everyone. I'm sure that we'll be joined by many more folks and we appreciate your interest in this workshop, which is around preparing for the upcoming Conference of the Parties 27. As you know by the title of the workshop you registered here, what we're hoping to do is to equip everyone to be able to distinguish, uh, interpret, and understand the positions and the messaging of all parties at this important conference. I'm delighted to be joined by journalists that cover food and agriculture and who will, some of them, be at the event, but who are familiar with global developments and food systems in climate and can help us interpret what is fact, what is politics, what is greenwashing. The end of today's session is to equip all of you who are participating to follow the proceedings at the conference, uh, to help you understand the interests and objectives of all the actors who are going to be there, the governments, the corporations, civil society organizations, and the advocates. And we hope that as a result of participating today, you feel more confident in identifying, understanding, and interpreting the grander dynamics that will be at play there. This event today is organized by the International Panel of Experts on Sustainable Food and by a growing culture. So we have a few logistics to handle before we actually begin. So if you would please update your screen name so that we know who you are and what organization you are affiliated with, that would be very helpful. And additionally, please make sure that your microphone is muted, uh, particularly during the panel discussion. One more important item is that we're prepared for an international audience. And so if you haven't discovered yet, we will be having interpretation into both Spanish as well as French. And so uh, you will find a little globe icon uh, under interpretation, the label interpretation, where you can select the language that you prefer. And if you're on a mobile platform, uh, the three dots that you'll see on your screen will open up some choices for you. An additional item for all of you to be aware of is that we are recording these sessions and each language separately for the purpose of actually sharing this to everyone who has registered. So if uh, you miss anything important uh, during the discussion, know that you will have access to the full recording. So here's what you can expect. I'm going to start us by doing a little bit of stage setting. And then we will follow that by my asking our esteemed panelists a set of very targeted questions to each of their expertise. And they will respond with brief introductory thoughts to stimulate the subsequent conversation. During the panel discussion, you are welcome to submit your questions into the chat and our staff will be working to prepare them so that when we get to the formal Q&A section, we know uh, what the main themes are that you are wanting to know about, and they will help the facilitator make sure that we deal with all of the major questions that are emerging from you. We will shift, uh, if we manage things correctly, around uh, 50 minutes into the session. And at that point, I will pass on the moderation, moderation responsibilities to my colleague, in the win of Lighthouse reports. So those are the preliminaries. Let's get started with discussing the topic. We are here to discuss the interactions between the food system and climate, and a lot of the strategies that are going to be proposed at the COP meeting. You see here an illustration from a recent scientific report that in summary tells us that in the last year where a comprehensive database was assembled by these researchers, they documented that the food system accounts for 18 gigatons of CO2 equivalents per year globally, and that that represents about a third of total greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, now, within those contributions from the food system, the majority of them, 71% of them, come from land use activities. So this is everything from deforestation to actual production methods, such as applying fertilization, uh, 
enteric methane emissions from livestock production and so on. So this is an important factor. First of all, all of agriculture, the entire food system, which covers production to delivering the food to restaurants or to grocery stores, accounts for a third of global emissions. And the majority within that category is due to the production function. The remaining function is for the processing, the packaging, the transportation, the delivery to you. So this is basic background about the footprint of the food system. Now, one very important theme that we want to drive home in this discussion is that abstracting the effects of the food system or any sector on climate change by talking just about carbon or carbon dioxide equivalent actually misses the whole point, but it is to the advantage of folks who want to preserve the system that has got us to this point to begin with. And let me explain that. There is a sector, it is a corporate sector that has a vested interest in maintaining the structure of an extractive economy centered around taking carbon from the soil or deconstructing carbon that is embodied in biomass, as in the case of deforestation, and then profiting from that activity with one of the many results being the release of that carbon into the atmosphere. But the way that this looks is that oil is pumped out of the ground, forests are burned, people are displaced, entire communities are displaced, farmers, uh, putatively, some of the key actors in the system, are notably displaced in favor of a system which sees capital investment to make this system function as the main indicator for its efficiency. In other words, the return to the capital investment to set up oil exploration, deforestation, and the production of livestock and commodity crops for exchange around the planet requires financial return. And the greater that financial return, then the more successful that system is deemed to be. Because at the time that the system was put into place in the 17th and 18th centuries, this preceded the fossil fuel economy, this preceded the explosion in population, this preceded our understanding about the way that the planet works, then many of the important economic signals that according to market theory should condition our behaviors do not exist. We can freely pollute. These industries can freely displace people. These industries can freely pollute the air, the water, degrade soil. And there is really no economic signal. Governments can abet them in a couple of different ways. One is that they can prop up a system that otherwise wouldn't exist. Uh, it wouldn't be viable. And notoriously, the European Union and the United States uh, operate in this way. And they can also abet the system by uh, not noticing or regulating and permitting the active pollution that these industries and this mode of economic activity generates. So it's important not to lose sight of the ball here that whereas carbon emissions are one indicator of an extractive model that is outdated. In other words, we know better. We know better from science and we know better because there are populations of farmers around the world that have operated on another form of pragmatism parallel to science, which is traditional ancestral knowledge, a form of empiricism, which is another method that is utilized in science. It either works or it doesn't work. Not all traditional uh, cultures were successful, but those that have been successful have been so because they've understood the importance of balancing what is extracted from soil and returning that as a way of maintaining fertility. So be aware of abstracted conversations that only focus on carbon, that only focus on what we're going to do to keep the system in place and make it a little bit less bad uh, by relying on techno saviorism or by relying on the same industries that created this problem to capitalize on the technologies that they own to supposedly capture that carbon and return it for permanent storage where it will never be in flux again uh, in deep geological beds. It's important to keep the eye on the ball because then you need to ask who benefits from these economic activities. I'm sure everyone will agree that it is a perverse outcome for the industry that generated the situation that we're in to then economically benefit from trying to do something about that. In other words, they have no incentive 
to stop the behavior that generates the problem and will profit even more greatly by trying to mitigate it. So these are some of the things to keep in mind. And uh, on the part of a growing culture and IPS food, for us, it's very important that the well-being of the people who are involved in the systems that either are supported or are displaced by economic models, by business models, and by government policies be brought into the equation and that they not be subordinated to our judgment about the goodness of a system by measuring only the profits that the system generates. Those, after all, are only short term. We know that they're concentrated in a very small part of the economy, whereas the well being of people affects generations of human beings and indeed the prospect of humanity on the planet. So, with that brief introduction, let me just remind you with this image that hopefully you'll keep in mind uh, during this discussion and perhaps during COP that there is an entire corporate infrastructure that has a vested interest in continuing to extract. And uh, the reason why I wanted to give you this reminder is that it isn't just the fossil fuel companies, it's everyone else that depends on that fossil fuel in order to make the industrial approach to food and agriculture operate. And for us, the good news is that obviously there are alternatives. The alternative that we want to introduce and discuss uh, with you is known as agroecology. Uh, the term should be self-explanatory, uh, but it essentially means an approach to agriculture and the food system that is informed by ecological knowledge of the sort that both contemporary science has provided. In other words, we now understand the way that the planet works, as well as ancestral knowledge systems that have survived until this era. And the agroecological approach does what I've suggested earlier, which is to recognize that we have to consider more than just profits in judging the goodness of a system, and that particularly the well being of all human beings are uh, involved is important. That is, uh, unless we want to support an exploitative system, one that exploits both people and nature, this is a viable alternative. So, uh, with that, I think that what we'll do is now begin to turn to the great power that these industries have. I'm not going to underscore that, but the reason for mentioning this is that the civil society organizations that represent the alternatives on which our future depends do not have the power, the economic access that the large corporations have to governments. And so it's important to keep an eye as you interpret what's happening at COP and you hear the different uh, arguments uh, that we must balance the voices the messages that come from these different sectors with the access that they have to the halls of power. So let me give you an introduction to the experts that we have assembled uh, today. Uh, I'm Ricardo Salvador. I am the director of the Food and Environment Program at the Union of Concerned Scientists, and I'm an agricultural scientist. Um, one of the most credible folks that we have on this panel is Eddie Mukibi, who is a farmer himself and is the current president of Slow Food International. He is based in Uganda. Additionally, we're joined by Lin Li Ching. Ching is a senior researcher at the Third World Network, and she is a peer of mine at the International Panel of Experts on Sustainable Food. And we're joined by one of your peers, the investigative journalist at Lighthouse Reports, Thin Li Nguyen. We're also joined by uh, one of my heroes, Shafali Sharma, who is the Director of the Institute of Agriculture and Trade Policy based in Europe. And so with that, we're ready to proceed to questions. So uh, what I'd like to do is to begin with a question that I'm targeting to Ching. Ching, um, I um, want to ask you about the backdrop of the current conference. Uh, everyone is familiar with the catastrophes that we're dealing with simultaneously in all parts of the world with uh, floods, with catastrophic droughts, and the fact that we have a global food crisis tied to disruptions in the food supply chain. So could you please make sure that we all understand the ways in which the food system are actually contributing to these crises, particularly the climate change crisis? and how agriculture itself is being affected by that climate change. Yes, um, thank you, Ricardo. And um, I think you know the, the first couple of slides that you showed illustrate this nicely. 
But the first point I wanted to make was really that we need to be clear about which types of agriculture are contributing to climate change. Um, because the current crises in agriculture, including the contribution of the sector to climate change, are primarily caused by industrial agriculture, which of course we know is fossil fuel dependent, promotes land use change and is monoculture focused. As you've mentioned, the world's industrial food systems are the single most important contributor to greenhouse gas emissions, more than a third of global anthropogenic emissions. Now, where do these emissions come from? You've mentioned some of them, of course, industrial cropping, ranching and land use changes, uh, for example, deforestation, which contribute a quarter of those emissions and the remainder from processing, transport, retail, etc. But we mustn't forget also the other potent greenhouse gases because cropland managed unsustainably is the main anthropogenic source of nitrous oxide with synthetic nitrogen fertilizers, again, a mainstay of industrial agriculture, being a big culprit. And likewise, it is large-scale conventional agriculture, mainly livestock and rice monocrops, which contribute a large amount of global uh, anthropogenic methane emissions. And of course, there's a close relationship between climate change and agriculture. Uh, emissions contribute to a spiraling climate crisis that in turn affects agriculture adversely. And we know that agriculture is increasingly vulnerable to climate change impacts, with millions of people exposed to food crises now. And climate change is actually pushing many staple crops beyond their limits, threatening global harvests. And it is the monocultures of industrial food systems, ironically, that are more vulnerable to climate change because of their reduced diversity and hence limited capacity to spread risks. But I think an important point is that the impacts are also inequitable. For example, an overall decline in productivity is predicted, but particularly so for the global south, with resulting impacts on livelihoods or when floods, droughts and extreme climate events cause sudden losses of food production. These often result in increased malnutrition, but especially so for indigenous peoples, small-scale food producers and low-income households. So finally, and this circles back to the point about identifying which agriculture is responsible for climate change and how the effects are inequitable. Small-scale traditional and biologically diverse forms of agriculture have comparatively minimal input to greenhouse gas emissions. But the farmers who practice such agriculture are disproportionately adversely affected by climate change, even though they have done little to cause the crisis. Now, this really underscores the urgent need for climate justice action and transforming food systems away from industrial agriculture. Thank you so much for that, Chin. Sin, let me turn to you and ask you a question that many of your peers are going to be interested in. Um, as a journalist who writes about climate change and food systems, what do you see as the big stories and particularly what are some of the things on the horizon that haven't yet caught attention and folks are not speaking about yet? Um, well, thanks, Ricardo. I want to make a few quick points. One is, you know, in your introduction, you mentioned about the fact that food systems account for a third of total, you know, man-made greenhouse gas emissions. So I think one important thing to remember is that any climate action plan that doesn't address it is bound to fail because research has shown that even if we stop all emissions from other sources right now immediately, those from food systems are actually going to push us beyond the 1.5 degrees limit, right? So what we really need to do, I think, is to see food systems, uh, climate change, biodiversity loss, and to a certain extent conflict as one interconnected issue. And journalists need to be covering it in that manner. That is a big challenge, I will admit, because at least from my experience, when I was working for a news agency, you're just so busy covering the day-to-day -day events that sometimes it's hard to see the bigger picture. Things like work counts are also a big barrier. But having said that, we really need to try and present this, you know, in a in, in a systemic issue way. Um, Ching talked about this earlier as well, the linkages between climate and agriculture. And a scientist that I interviewed five years ago um, said that agriculture and climate are in an unhappy marriage because they're so tightly intertwined with each other and yet are very antagonistic towards each other. So what we try to do at Lighthouse Report to cover it in a holistic way 
is to look at power imbalances and false narratives, narratives. So exposing the bad actors, finding cracks in the system, and then to emphasize alternatives to the industrial agriculture. So for example, we've been investigating which actors are fueling or benefiting from the current uh, global cost of living crisis. We're looking at lobbying to sort of water down environmental and social safeguards under this fault pretense that we need to produce more food in Europe. You know, we look at big meat uh, practices in terms of tax avoidance. So the three big picture points I want journalists to to, to, to remember is the interconnectedness of the food and climate crises, the, the power imbalances and the false narratives. And very quickly, in terms of individual stories, five things that I think they should look out for. One, alternative to the industrial agriculture, like agroecology that both you and Ching were talking about, local seed systems that support small scale farmers, but are being threatened by laws that now criminalize some of that. Um, there's probably gonna be a lot of talk and initiatives uh, and projects launched at this COP about fertilizer issue, but the impact is not universal and you, we, need to, we need to cover that. Number four, the fact that there is very little public climate finance that goes into food systems, only 3%, according to a report that just came out yesterday. And the fifth and last is there is an urgent need to repurpose subsidies and we need to write about it because most of the current subsidies are really bad for the environment, the bad for biodiversity, health and resilience. You know, the problem with focusing purely on carbon is that we're missing the bigger picture, both in terms of the other guesses that Ching talked about, methane, N2O, but also the solutions on the ground, as well as the power balances that perpetuate the problems. Back to you. Thank you very much for that, Tim. That was incredibly comprehensive. Let me turn to you, Shafali, and let me give you two questions that are tightly connected with each other. So up until now, food systems really have not been prominent in COP discussions. And so I'm curious whether you see that that is going to be different this time. And the related question is, if that is the case, then what would COP27 need to achieve to give us a realistic chance to insert food system discussions in a constructive way to the dialogue? Thank you, Ricardo, and thanks for having me on the panel. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so um, at COP27 in Sham el Sheikh, there will be several food system pavilions at, at, uh, dur during the whole COP with different visions promoting different visions for what agriculture and the food system needs. There will also be announcements by agribusiness, by <clears throat> governments like the US-led initiative Aim for Climate, which is proposing their own vision for what agriculture and climate smart agriculture should look like. But also within the actual negotiating halls, there are certain things happening that I think are important to uh, track. One is the Article 6 negotiations uh, from the Paris Agreement, which is about how and whether to include carbon markets and carbon credits towards countries' mitigation and adaptation efforts. <clears throat> There's also an ongoing, it's been going since 2017 and has concluded this discussion on agriculture and the Coronivia work program. Now governments will have to decide um, whether they continue to discuss agriculture in a work program within the UNFCCC, and if so, what would that vision for agriculture look like? What would those solutions look like? So the vision being pushed uh, by industry in which other speakers have referred to is, including an aim for climate, is one that tinkers around the edges of an industrial agriculture system, right? And this vision goes something like, we need further intensification and industrialization to spare land and water resources. Our resources are scarce. Only agribusiness can deliver the most by emitting the least. It's really the smallholders that are inefficient and those extensive systems that are much more polluting over on average for the, the number of people we need to feed. Uh, we need to cut greenhouse gases as a result just per unit of food that we produce, food and beverages that we produce. Not our overall emissions, but the unit of uh, of food that we produce. It's called emissions intensity reduction. It's a technical term. And what we say to that is, well, the climate doesn't care about emissions intensity reduction. The climate cares about 
total reduction of emissions. And in the agriculture sector, it's the industrial agriculture sector that is responsible for the bulk of the food system emissions. So the real test is whether we are, you know, creating a, a systems change towards reducing agriculture's climate footprint. And not just climate footprint, as others have pointed out. Our overall, um, you know, how are we, we basically, industrial agriculture has, has breached several planetary boundaries, right? Our rivers, our water is polluted, the air we're breathing. This all has to do with a lot of the other gases that we're talking about, nitrous oxide, nitrates, nitrogen, um, uh, so, and, and methane, which needs to be cut. Part of this promotion of climate smart agriculture, which Aim for Climate is doing, is techno fixes. So often unproven techno fixes like feed additives. So it's not about the mass industrial production of, of livestock. It's about just trying to find feed additives that cut the amount of uh, you know, burps and farts that these cows or these goats will, will do and therefore we can address the problem. Um, and there are other things like more efficient use of agrochemicals, fertilizers, pesticides, glyphosate for, for no-till. Um, these are all practices that we know are not leading to producing differently. These are practices that we know are polluting land and water and pushing us beyond our planetary boundaries. And we also know that these technologies are owned and controlled by agribusiness. So they're concentrating wealth and power in the hands of agribusiness. So what, is, what needs to happen at COP? Um, well, certainly in the Article 6 negotiations, it should not lead to loopholes for polluters whether they're agribusiness or fossil fuel companies to turn land into a tradable asset through carbon. This is one of the biggest problems that we're seeing. Um, agribusiness is ramping up the development and acquisition of carbon credits, um, also known as carbon offsets, uh, both within their supply chain and outside of their supply chain. So what is an offset? An offset is when a polluter buys a carbon credit to have somebody else outside that um, you know, outside of the company, do something to reduce emissions, and then taking that to compensate for their own emissions. And what we've seen as a result of 20, 30 years of trying to create the clean development mechanism in, in, um, in the UNFCCC is that carbon offsets don't work. They allow polluters to continue polluting. And at the same time, um, it, it doesn't enforce the kind of action that we need for these companies to actually cut their own emissions. Um, and I think uh, Ching talked about why are we putting the onus on smallholder producers or others that have had nothing to do with the climate crisis to then help compensate for um, companies and governments that are, are, are responsible for the bulk of the climate crisis. So there's, an, there's a climate justice and an equity issue here as well. Another thing that needs to happen is that countries need to do more to commit to reducing industrial agriculture emissions, right? So barely any agriculture commitments have been made by countries in their commitments to cut emissions in what is called the nationally determined contributions, the NDCs. Southern farmers in developing countries are asking for climate finance. Um, my colleague just said that, you know, only 3% of climate finance is actually going towards food systems. And in addition, loss and damage, there's a huge area of negotiations that is saying climate chaos is here. We're not waiting till 2030 for that to happen. We've seen that with the floods in Pakistan, in Nigeria, uh, droughts in the North and the South. Um, loss and damage is very real. That is uh, destroying food systems and the ability of farmers to, and, and farm workers to be able to cope. So there needs to be money for that um, devoted to helping um, developing countries deal with the climate chaos and ensuring that their food systems survive this. Um, what else? Um, I mean, these are just some of the, some of the key issues, I would say, that are, that are critical as we talk about it. But I think most importantly is, you know, if governments are gonna continue to talk about um, their vision for agriculture within the UNFCCC, what kind of vision are they going to be promoting? And this is, I think, the key here. Are they gonna be promoting a vision that tinkers around the edges or are they gonna be promoting a vision that is, is transformative, that is actually leading to systems change um, so that we are creating agriculture and food systems that are resilient, that are able to create biodiversity and restore ecosystems 
And this is why we supporting agroecology and the agroecological transformation of the food system. Thanks. Thank you very much, Fali. Um, you raised a very important question about the economic interests uh, that I'm going to direct to Ching next. But before we do that, let me remind everyone that this is the time to be thinking about the questions that you want the panel to discuss. So please formulate those and enter those into the chat so that our staff can begin to parse through them and uh, categorize them to make sure that we hit all of the major themes that are coming up. So uh, Ching, let me come back to you. Uh, so per one of the issues that Shefali just outlined for us, mm -hmm. could you help us understand the business and economic interests that are at stake in the discussions that it caught? Very specifically, who benefits or who stands to lose? What are all these different parties and sectors trying to get out of COP? Well, those are big questions, Ricardo. Um, well, I think, you know, the UNFCCC, you know, is seen as a multilateral environmental agreement, right? But actually, um, the action that is required to address climate change really impacts economic interests to the core. So a lot is at stake, and there are many interests uh, which are competing for attention uh, at the COPs. Basically, the climate emergency means that we have to stop emitting and start decarbonizing our economies. And this, of course, has to start with the global north, which holds historical responsibility for the emissions already in the atmosphere. But then we have a case where uh, the situation where fossil fuel majors and other business interests are determined to continue with business as usual and to protect their profits. And we know this story. We've heard of many of the corporations that have invested in undermining scientific consensus on climate change, blocking legislation meant to regulate their polluting activities and greenwashing their activities. I'm going to say a little bit about um, the last um, 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 issue because I think that's going to come up quite a lot uh, at the upcoming COP. Really one sort of what I call a great escape is uh, the corporations has devised really is to deflect attention away from the root causes of climate change, i.e. greenhouse gas emissions, and therefore away from the urgent action that is needed, i.e. to stop emitting. Now, how do they do this? And Shafali has talked about this already uh, in terms of offsets, but we now see um, the creeping in of a new term called nature-based solutions. So corporations claim that their emissions can be offset or compensated for by nature, for example, by planting trees, protecting forests, or tweaking industrial farming practices to store carbon in the plants and the soil. Of course, this all sounds like a good thing, but a closer look uh, at this uh, shows that it's really a vague aspirational term, which um, in the end don't actually reduce the overall concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Offsets do not do that. Why? Because polluters will continue emitting, and then essentially they're sort of paying for the license to do so by claiming to invest in nature to soak up their emissions. But the science is very, very clear. Stopping climate change will require us to stop using fossil fuels to power our economies and industrial agriculture. There really is no time left to allow some to continue to burn fossil fuels while nature somehow compensates for that, for that burning. Just want to flag a new ICAS food briefing which will be released on Thursday called Smoke and Mirrors, Examining Competing Framings of Food System Sustainability, which shows how nature-based solutions amounts to little more than greenwashing of harmful industrial agriculture practices, what Shefali called tinkering uh, with industrial agriculture, not really system change. But even worse, the coupling of nature-based solutions with unproven carbon offsetting schemes is very risky for indigenous peoples and farmers and communities in the South because it's their lands and territories that will be targeted for those offset programs. And this makes such concepts merely a cover for green grabs that undermine people's rights and threaten the land and resources they depend on. Thanks. Thank you very much for that, Ching. I now want to turn to my fellow agronomist, uh, Eddie. And Eddie, as a farmer, what can you share with us about what small farmers the world over, who, by the way, are numerically the majority of farmers on the globe and are responsible for producing the majority of the actual food supply on the planet, what do small farmers need out of COP27? And also, how 
can the COP process itself be more inclusive of the input and needs of farmers on the ground? I'm asking you this because this is a meeting where traditionally the great powers, the corporate speakers, receive the lion's share of the attention. And ostensibly, they're doing so on behalf of farmers, and yet we rarely get to hear the voice of farmers themselves. So could you share your thoughts about this? Thank you, Ricardo. Um, we, uh, like, like, like you say, the smallholder farmers globally uh, produce more than a third of the global food that is available for, for our human consumption. But also smallholder farmers globally are, are the most affected by the, um, and also the most vulnerable people or group of the population by the cri uh, climate crisis impacts. Dra uh, for taking an example of the droughts, current and uh, uh, recent droughts in East Africa, uh, which affected so many smallholder farmers, especially those who were trying to imitate and uh, copy the uh, Green Revolution um, approaches to food production. So smallholder farmers uh, are really affected by the climate crisis. Uh, but again, my worry like other smallholder farmers across the globe is that COP slowly or consistently is becoming just a round table for industry uh, for big agriculture, for industrial agriculture, and all those uh, uh, polluting organizations and corporations in, in their food system uh, to negotiate their right to pollute and also to uh, negotiate new climate deals <clears throat> that put billions of uh, uh, life, uh, put uh, uh, the livelihoods of billions of people at stake. So, as smallholder farmers uh, uh, globally, it's also speaking on my own, uh, my own behalf and the behalf of so many other millions and millions of smallholder agroecological farmers, we are, we, we are demanding uh, that uh, COP27 to treat the climate crisis as an emergency that uh, actually is taking lives and livelihoods of millions of people by focusing on real but not false solutions to climate change. Real solutions are lying in agroecological systems and also in the the transition from the more destructive and high uh, fossil fuel dependent production systems to those which are based on the local knowledge and preserve the local resources. We demand that COP2017 put agroecology at the center of discussions because it's not just an alternative production system, it's the alternative, it, it's the system, the approach, the production approach that will take us away from this climate mess that the industrial agriculture has driven us into. So we demand that COP should reject the, fact, uh, the false and greenwashing washing solutions which are being pre uh, uh, presented with the aim of promoting uh, more industrial um, uh, uh, footprint in the agricultural sector, in the food system. We demand that uh, these false solutions are put aside and we discuss real solutions that are centering around agroecology that are protecting lives of millions of indigenous people, smallholder farmers, small fisher folks, and also that protect the um, ecosystems. We also demand uh, for increased incentives. I, I will not say that we demand for, uh, for subsidies as smallholder ecological farmers, but we need to incentivize, incentivize or to increase incentives for uh, ecological agriculture. We do quite a lot to reduce the polluting or to eliminate the polluting potential of agriculture to promote, to produce clean food, to pro ensure that food is produced in a clean uh, environment and a clean climate. So we need more and more incentives in terms of policies, in terms of uh, programs, in terms of uh, support, uh, research and other kind of incentives that will drive more and more farmers to do the right thing, to stick to agroecology and also to promote more and more uh, agroecology. And uh, uh, also uh, uh, the large scale monocrop farms are increasingly uh, destroying the natural ecosystems, cutting down forests, uh, destroying swamps and wetlands. We as smallholder farmers like me, I all lockdown planting 800 indigenous trees on my banana, vanilla and coffee farm, while in the western part of the country, the sugar industry is destroying the whole natural tropic forest to expand their production. So this should stop. This should be discussed at COP to stop 
this destructive production system and support the ecological uh, regenerative production approaches that we smallholder farmers are putting in place. Brilliant, Eddie. Thank you very much for laying all of that out for us. So um, one of the things that we're seeing is that COP27 is shaping up to be a place where there's going to be a clash of visions for agriculture. What we've been laying out here is an agroecological approach, which is about a dramatic shift in the driving paradigm of agriculture, which is about understanding the way that the planet works by managing the biogeochemical cycles that we now understand in a way that we can regenerate uh, the resources as well as provide for livelihood of all people who farm. And there's the alternative, which is the extractive model, which is archaic. It's not informed by modern science and which has gotten us into the climate change crisis that we're experiencing at the moment. Uh, Eddie, can I ask you to very specifically tell us how the type of agriculture that you and farmers like you are practicing, the agroecological agric approach, how it is actually mitigating and adapting to climate change. And also, let me give you a little bit of, of a guide. We have a little bit less than 10 minutes for you to address this and also for our final uh, question. So uh, please give us your, your answer. Uh, thank you, Ricardo, for this also. It's a very interesting uh, uh, question, but when we talk about uh, um, the visions, the conflicting visions, I think that there, there should be, uh, 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 it's now becoming clear and more evident with the current crisis, we should be focusing on one vision that is uh, uh, regenerative and, uh, and do uh, away with a system that is destructive and exploitative. While the monocrop and industrial um, uh, crop and uh, li uh, livestock uh, production system is focusing on taking away all forms of life from the planet, the agroecological approach to production aims at bringing back diversity and bringing back life to the planet. So we are talking about um, a system that has the potential to produce food in a, in a way that does not pollute, that does not contribute to greenhouse gases. Because when we talk about agroecology, we are not only focusing on cutting carbon emissions, we are focusing on reducing the impact of agriculture in relation to all greenhouse gases. The industrial system of crop production is based on, a lot on nitrogen fertilizers. Lim talked about um, the, 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 the consumption uh, of nitrogen fertilizers in the monocrop systems is enormous, but the whole production process of fertilizers uh, the nitrogen based fertilizers produce enormous amounts of greenhouse gases, especially nitrous oxide. In agroecology, we use local and traditional systems. We use local knowledge to generate uh, soil amendments uh, that rebuild the soil health by compost manure, and they don't, do not involve external um, um, uh, fossil fuel based approaches. So the consumption and the emission of greenhouse gases is almost not existent in the agroecological production system. And again, we are, we are talking about uh, uh, agroecology, a system that promotes biodiversity. This, uh, for farmers to adapt to the current climate crisis, we need to diversify our production. I've, I have visited many farms in the recent uh, drought in East Africa, I've been moving around, seeing how monocrop farms have been affected by the drought, because once thousands of uh, hundreds of hectares are destroyed uh, of the single crop are destroyed by the drought, the farmer has no fallback position. Uh, it leads to a lot of losses, but on farms which are diversified, especially here in the tropics where we have less and less control over the uh, climate, over the uh, uh, environment we produce food, we always have a fallback position through agroforestry, through diversified production systems. You cannot, as a farmer, go hungry, even when there are adverse climatic conditions like droughts, floods, because some tropical crops, some other crops will withstand. This is the value of agroecology that promotes and uh, uh, thrives on local biodiversity and local knowledge. Looking at uh, uh, also uh, uh, agroecology, uh, agro 
we are we also recently the discussion on meat has become very very important when we talk about climate there is always a discussion on meat and livestock production um agroecology thrives on uh, the integral part of uh, livestock to the health of the soil to the health of the ecosystem not the destructive uh, intensive livestock production that actually makes uh, the whole livestock production look like it's the biggest culprit to uh, climate change the industrial system should be pinned and blamed for this system not uh, uh, the small 20 10 goats free range goats which are providing manure to a smallholder farmer to rebuild the soil health and also to rebuild the the the, the soil system and also to use uh, some of the products to control the envi other environmental problems like pests. So when we talk about meat and uh, uh, climate change, we need to understand that it's the industrial production that is greatly contributing to the problem of the uh, greenhouse gas emission. Greenhouse gases like methane, it's in, a lot from the industrial systems, uh, but uh, um, uh, animals and animal products which are produced on a, a smallholder farms uh, using uh, um, approaches which respect the, um, the animal uh, welfare and also the environmental uh, aspects should not be put in the same discussion like the industrial system. We need to understand which system is destructive and which this system is regenerative. So we- That is uh, a brilliant point there, Eddie. Eddie, can I ask you uh, for us to end on that point there, the, the difference between those two systems, which you just brilliantly summarized for those. And, and I hate to cut that off only because uh, we need to provide as much time as possible for the interaction with journalists. And we do want to have a little bit of time to ask the final question to prompt the discussion, which ties back to our introduction. Uh, as I laid things out at the beginning, um, it is dysfunctional to focus strictly on carbon fluxes to understand the total package of how the food system both affects and is affected by climate change. So let me ask two of our experts here about this. So, um, Shivani and Ching, I want you each to very quickly give us your assessment of this very specific question. Do you think that a focus on carbon is useful, or do you think that it is a problem? Okay, um, I think I'll jump in here. I think, you know, focusing on carbon solely tends to divert resources towards, of course, measurement, reporting, verification of carbon stocks, which is what we see today, and with the uh, fixation on carbon markets. Whereas for the millions of farmers for whom climate change is already a clear and present danger, prioritizing adaptation and resilience is critical. And of course, what we're facing today are multiple and interlinked crises. It's been mentioned many times. In addition to climate change, we need to address food insecurity, biodiversity loss, declining health, etc. And for these problems, we actually need systemic and holistic solutions, such as agroecology. And agroecology can certainly play a major part in removing emissions from agricultural production. There's no doubting that uh, it can help sequester carbon, for example. But it is more than that. It is a holistic approach with multifunctional benefits, including adaptation, biodiversity protection, ecological and social resilience, healthy nutrition and diets, and sustainable livelihoods. So I think we do need to move away from a singular focus on carbon as a metric, to actually measuring the multiple benefits of working respectfully with ecosystems and people living in them. And of course, this means a focus on longer term benefits for smallholders and society at large, such as ecosystem health, livelihood resilience, healthy food and nutrition, and the economic viabilities of farms in the face of debt and climate shocks. So then measures such as nutritional quality, restoration of biodiversity, provision of ecosystem functions, equity, justice become highly relevant. And by those counts, agroecology certainly contributes to climate resilient and sustainable agricultural and food systems. Thank you. Thank you. Shivali? Yeah, <clears throat> thanks. I'll just pick up from where Ching left off and uh, I would agree with her. Uh, I think a uh, narrow focus on carbon accounting ignores the overall system of farming and whether it's actually restoring ecosystems or creating biodiversity. Um, 
These are critical for climate resilience and agricultural adaptation to climate change. And she talked about how, how a focus on carbon leads to monitoring, reporting, and verifying. And the fact is that it's expensive carbon consultants who are hired to do this monitoring, reporting, and verification. So I think there was a question in the chat that said, you know, what about us wh where we don't have enough information uh, about greenwashing and climate claims? Um, what should our governments be doing? And there's an enormous amount of pressure on governments to, to increase carbon credits, especially in developing countries in Africa and elsewhere, that this is gonna bring you lots of money that you wouldn't get otherwise. And this is the whole point. For instance, in the Kenya Agriculture Carbon Project, carbon consultants get thousands and thousands of, of dollars to monitor, report, and verify. Kenyan farmers, as of two years ago, got $15 a year for, for implementing all of these practices. Now, wouldn't it be so much better if you could just use all those thousands of dollars and pour, put it into the agricultural system within Kenya to support the farmers in doing the right thing? And the fact of the matter is that climate change is wreaking havoc on carbon sinks through floods, fires, droughts, this whole idea that we're gonna sequester all this carbon inland Sequestering carbon in land is temporary. And as several people have said in the chat, emitting, carb emitting carbon dioxide through fossil fuels, it lasts for thousands, thousands of years. So actually there's no comparison between offsetting between fossil fuels and land-based sinks. But even if you were just offsetting within an agriculture supply chain, which is what companies like Nestle want to do, um, which is saying, hey, if we just get our farmers to do everything efficiently, use less fertilizer, use less chemical pesticides, we will get credit for that. And that credit can be used to offset our carbon dioxide emissions. The bottom line is, you know, or we'll get farmers to sequester this carbon. These sinks are becoming, uh, you know, these are the basis of massive amounts of land grabs. We've seen this with Red Plus, where um, forests, uh, are being taken by carbon aggregators or, or certain projects where you have human rights violations and human rights problems. So, and in the in the West, even in in Europe, this is this is leading to land speculation. For instance, in Scotland, um, so land is scarce, right? We we need it for lots of different things, and if we're going to turn it into a carbon asset or a carbon commodity, this is highly problematic because then we get into human rights problems, land speculation all the risks um, farmers having to adapt. So it is infinitely better to be thinking about a way to directly support the transition to agroecology where carbon is a co-benefit rather than the other way around where biodiversity may be a co-benefit for certain practices. Um, time is short, so I'll end there, but maybe I can elaborate in other statements, thanks. Yes, thank you so much, Shafali. There, there will be plenty of time during the interaction with uh, journalists, and we want to make sure that we privilege that block of time. So with that, thank you very much, uh, everyone on the panel, for helping us to frame up the issues and to provide grist for uh, the journalists who have joined us to dig deeper into the issues that most interest them. Now, uh, let me transition to that by providing a resource for you. Uh, we are calling this a toolkit. And what we mean by that is that we have several questions that might help as you hear arguments and proposals during the run uh, comp. So let's have a look at these just really quickly, and hopefully we'll provide you uh, some guidance. So here's the question. When you hear a proposed solution, ask yourself whether it will substantially reduce emissions from food systems for the long term. I'll just very quickly tell you that a lot of what is being supported at the moment uh, in uh, a program called Climate Smart Commodities in the United States by its Department of Agriculture is throwing billions of dollars at farmers without verifiable assurance that the practices are intrinsically effective and much less for the long term. Such questions as what if the farmer decides to change a crop? What if the land changes ownership? How will that affect the billions that we're investing now ostensibly for long-term climate benefit? So ask yourself that question. Next, 
Another way to help you distinguish whether you're hearing greenwashing is to ask yourself whether root causes are being addressed. So for instance, is the solution designed by engaging with the communities that are going to be affected? Uh, does the solution promote the producer and community autonomy, uh, equity, and livelihoods? And equity being particularly important here in terms of recognizing the asymmetry and power and access of the communities of small scale producers around the planet and the communities that depend on them for their food. So it is important to balance the difference in power that corporate actors and the civil society groups and farm groups around the planet have. Next, is the solution something that will lead to diversification at all scales? Because one of the principles of agroecology is that you need to have the part to the system required to cycle all of the different benefits of an agroecological system. They could be energetic, they could be nutrients, they could be economic, but they all add up to well being on the basis of managing a whole system, not an abstracted reductionist approach to a single component of the system. And then lastly, does it help the food system to cope with extreme and unpredictable results of climate change, such as droughts, storms, heat waves, and floods? Amazingly, often we hear technological tour de forces to deal with fluxes of carbon and don't ask the hard questions about whether the implementation of these schemes, which will indeed result in a lot of infrastructure, a lot of techno wizardry and a lot of profit for the corporations that incorporate them, will actually be effective in terms of dealing with the effects of climate change. So uh, hopefully these will provide some uh, guideposts uh, as you hear the dialogue during COP. So with Ricardo, we lost you on audio, just a quick. Oh, yes. That is not my pleasure to introduce my colleague, Finn who is going to help moderate the discussion from this point on. Um, and so, Tim, let me just pass it on to you without further ado. Thank you very much, Ricardo. I have big shoes to fill, but I'll try my best. Um, I see that we already have a huge list of q and A, so we're going to just go straight to them and we want to try and get um, and respond to as many of them as possible. We will prioritize questions from journalists, um, and I would like to just request our panelists to limit their answers and responses to, you know, concise and to the point maximum two minutes. Um, and to the journalists as well, please feel free to follow up with the panelists for further details. Um, let me just go to the first question. Um, Ching, this is to you. Um, this is coming from Neil Kamal from the Times of India, who asks, how much is climate change contributing to food insecurity in the world right now? And how much can mitigation and adaptation help? And how much finance is going to need to actually decrease the hunger index? Well, wow. okay. Uh, I will try to be brief and concise. I think, you know, we can see, uh, you know, the, the realities of climate change uh, affecting uh, food security at the moment. We think about the floods and absolute devastation in Pakistan, for example, uh, you know, uh, where climate change has wreaked havoc. Uh, which makes, you know, not, not just, we're not just talking about food production and ability to access food anymore by itself, but people's lives are literally at risk. Um, how much can, you know, and, and we know that there are main, you know, the main impacts and what we will see in the future will only get worse with more extreme weather events, uh, with a predicted uh, fall in, in production. We have a system that is really, in, in a sense, the industrial food system, it's on its knees. It can't cope with shock after shock after shock. Add to that, of course, uh, you know, countries having to cope with the debt crisis. Uh, add to that uh, the economic shocks uh, that countries are experiencing post-COVID. Uh, so this, this makes it a very, very complex, difficult situation. 
The next question on how much mitigation and adaptation can help. Well, of course, mitigation will help, but it needs to be done now. And that's why we need to cut through the false solutions. We need to actually stop emitting now. We know that this is a really, really difficult task for many economies, but we have to have the political will to do that and to really, really change the system. Not just the agricultural system, but the whole economic system on which um, you know, our, our economies are based, because we cannot keep on these sorts of extractive uh, industries. Adaptation, of course, will help. Importantly, um, agroecology, um, as we've talked about in this session, is important to help farmers uh, to cope with some of this. But that won't be enough. We know that it's not a magic solution either. And the severity of the climate crisis and emergency in front of us is so great that we really need to put a lot more into, for example, infrastructure, uh, loss and damage was talked about. Uh, these are key, key factors in the negotiations uh, which must help countries cope with this. Financing, well, I mean, the rich will promise 100 billion uh, US dollars a year uh, to developing countries. Um, and this is not just for um, agri um, agriculture issues. This is for the whole, their whole climate obligations, right? And we know that that has not been forthcoming. There are more recent analysis that shows that the amount of financing needed is actually in the trillions. Now, can we do this? We know that the world mobilized a huge amount of money during the COVID crisis. It's really about political will. Um, I'll stop there, sorry. No, that's fine. You managed to answer, you know, multiple questions in a short time. So I really appreciate that. Thank you. Um, okay, next questions. Oh, okay, they're directed towards me. I'll I'll read them out. What are the biggest obstacles that the journalists are having? trying to get their food and climate stories out to the public. That's from Stephen Jay at Mobilize News and Lucas Posada from Cochina Intuitiva. How could we write about these important topics in a way that is digestible and trendy? Okay, I'll try and make this as quick as possible as well. I think the biggest obstacles are, well, there, there, there are multiple ones, right? I talked about the fact that there's a limited time and capacity. You know, journalism in this point in time is is over you know, undergoing serious changes and challenges like in, in, in many other sectors. So there is there is a big issue um, in trying to understand because we all think we understand food and agriculture and climate, but we don't. There's so much, like we said, techno fixes, false solutions, and to be able to wait through them is is an, you know, it's 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 one of the big obstacles. But I also think we need to get editors, um, publishers who understand these issues and see them as, as, as one interconnected challenge. Um, but I do think there are lots of ways of covering these important topics in a way that's it's, it's, you know, digestible and trendy. Um, one is to talk about solutions, right? A lot of the times when we talk about food and climate, we tend to focus a lot on the negative aspects. But for example, people like Eddie, what he's doing, you know, as a small farmer in Uganda, there's so many um, other people, even as part of IPES food or a growing culture, you know, regularly does these webinars with these fantastic um, local farmers that are doing amazing stuff. So I think, you know, that's definitely one way of getting people to get interested is to show the positive aspects, what's being done on the ground, you know, and, and before I end, just very briefly, I do think that journalists have a fantastic opportunity, right, because people are now listening, people are now thinking about this and interested about what's happening with the food systems and climate change because of the global cost of living crisis. So we should really take this opportunity to better understand it and write about it, because the bottom line is you can come up with the most effective lithium ion battery or carbon sequence a capture and storage technology, but if we can't resolve the broken food systems and their impacts on the environment, we're not going to be able to survive. Essentially, we're gonna die, right? If there's no food or water, you know, whatever techno fixes, they're not gonna, they're not gonna work. So I think we have to think about it in that aspect as well. Um, okay, next question to Eddie. This is from Zoena. Are governments ready to accept and adopt agroecology as the best agriculture method? Um, they, they, I'll be very, very specific. The governments are working uh, 
uh, in a very complex way. But uh, what I can say is that uh, they, our advocacy work also to approach the Ministry of Agriculture in different countries has shown positive trend towards uh, agroecology. And some countries um, are starting to set up to, to bring up policies which are um, based on the agroecological approach to production. The uh, Uganda already passed the organ ecological organic agriculture policy. It's also uh, uh, we are leading the the um, this uh, process to develop the national agro agroecology strategy. Uh, countries like Senegal they have already adopted uh, uh, agroecology into their uh, agricultural laws and setting up eco villages. Uh, this is a, a a positive trend and there is a growing trend once they understand that this is the way to go. And also the, uh, uh, the current uh, crisis has uh, made many people to rethink food uh, uh, systems towards more local and uh, uh, people controlled systems to break away from the dependency on the, uh, uh, from the global uh, fragile uh, uh, food uh, system. So there is a very big and growing trend in the governments, but there is still more work to be done on advocacy and also research and uh, collection of and publication of uh, positive experiences. Great, thank you, Eddie, and thank you for reinforcing me on the positive experience aspect. Um, Shafali, I've got a question for you. Um, it's Neil Kamal from Times of India as well. We, I think, a few of us talked about the fact that the climate you know, public climate finance on food systems is actually really low, 3%. And he's asking, is that enough even to compensate loss and damage, you know, even not taking into account the sustainability aspects of it? So this is to do with climate finance and the 3% number. Um, do you mean, uh, is 3% enough or are you saying... Is that yeah, so the question is, is 3% of, you know, climate finance for agriculture enough even to compensate loss and damage, let alone talking about sustainability? Right. Yeah, absolutely not, right? We're asking for a massive amounts for loss and damage. And 3% uh, and is a very minuscule amount. And what we've been seeing is actually a funding and support for agriculture through overseas uh, development aid has been going down. And where it is coming, it is going towards some of the false solutions that what we're talking about. It's not going towards agroecology and it's not going towards uh, solutions that will help climate resilience, biodiversity, ecosystem restoration. This is fundamentally what we need. We need to restore ecosystems in order to deal with climate chaos. Um, Eddie talks about creating diversity. We need to, to spread risk. Right, and how do you spread risk? You create diversity in our food system. You, you provide farmers and growers choices and solutions. And you need governments to enact those kinds of policies that help spread that risk for farmers and for um, other workers in the food system. And this is gonna require massive amounts of investment into food systems and into infrastructure that is going to build that resilience from the bottom up. So not just food systems, but also economic systems that allow that kind of resilience. I think Ching talked about how, how um, you know, the system is, is vulnerable to climate chaos, to shocks, and we're witnessing that now. So I think it's really a wake up call for governments to say, we've been spending money in the wrong places. And if we spend money you know, some of the discussion is, do we spend money creating this whole infrastructure towards carbon trading and carbon credits? There's a lot of money that could go towards that, that could go directly towards supporting the kind of um, infrastructure and the support system that we need to shift to agroecology. Um, IATP has written a lot about why carbon markets don't work for farmers and agriculture, and we'd be happy to share that resource with you as well on that. Great, thank, thank you so much, Shafali. If you can, yeah, share that, perhaps some of those resources, the links in the chat, that would be great. And, and just to, you know, reiterate what Shafali said, particularly that 3% obviously is not enough and it's not going towards where it's needed to. Like Shafali said, you know, probably quite a bit of it is going to uh, projects like Aim4C, which 
um, as a technofix and not really, you know, going through at small scale farmers. Um, so that is a big problem. Um, Eddie, I have another question for you. Um, this is from Emma Beveridge, a freelance journalist. Um, really interesting question. Um, she says she's curious about the emotional benefit and ancestral connection in relationship to food and land. You know, as a smallholder farmer, do you have any examples of joy in working with your crops? I have a lot of uh, um, emotional stories about working with crops, especially as a person who um, tested and uh, worked in the industrial system before, and I saw how uh, that system is failing farmers. Because once you lose uh, a season's crop, you are gone, you are finished. You go into losses, you go into loans, and then in the end, you are frustrated. But again, working with uh, my agroecological farm, I see how crops interact with each other. And I also have a joy of harvesting crops from my farm, different varieties of crops, different species, 360 days a year uh, and planting all, almost 360 days. So this kind of continuity and um, um, uh, uh, seeing the interrelationship between one crop and another, is, it gives me a lot of joy. And also how my goats enjoy going out to the farm, especially in the banana garden to pick out uh, what um, I have left behind. So you see uh, the joy and the happiness and I'm, I'm really happy about this. And I'm safe with this agroecological farm. Great, thank you so much for that, Edie. Um, Ching and Shafali, I think the next question, um, it would we would benefit from hearing from both of you. Um, this is actually the same question from two journalists, uh, Mathilde uh, Gerard from Le Monde and Kabir Agarwal, um, who's an independent journalist from India. Kabir, I have to give him a shout out. He's been helping Lighthouse reports with some of our investigation into commodity speculations as well. So good journalist. Um, they have similar question, essentially. They talk about how in previous COPs and official climate negotiations, food and agriculture tended to be, you know, as a site topic, it wasn't a big issue. Um, would you say that it is now an issue that has been, sorry, would you say it's an issue that has been under addressed? And if that's the case, why? And whether do you have hopes that it can change with COP27? Um, Ching, maybe, uh, Shivali, can I start with you first? And then maybe I'll go to Ching. Sure. Can, can you repeat the question again? Sorry. Sure. So, you know, in the previous, you know, COP and climate negotiations, food and uh, food and agriculture tend to be sort of like on the back burner, you know. So, would you say that this issue has been under addressed? You know, why has it been the case? And do you, are you hopeful that things will change with COP twenty seven? Yeah, agriculture has a long and uh, and a sketchy history in 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 the UNFCCC. They did try to launch agriculture negotiations in a more serious way in 2010. That was the introduction of Climate Smart Agriculture. Actually, there was a big push by massive agriculture exporters to say, hey, we really want um, basically our solutions kind of codified in the agriculture negotiations. And there was a real pushback then, I think, from developing countries that said, hey, you know, um, what are we doing here? What kind of, what, you know, are there gonna be trade implications? What do you expecting us to do? And there was a huge debate in terms of how active or what should um, the UNFCCC, what should governments within the UNFCCC actually do here? In 2017, they did launch, as I mentioned, an agriculture work program. And there have been discussions through workshops over the last five years on various issues and in each, workshop, there has been this two visions, right? The industry is present there, the environmental NGOs are there, the governments are there. And, you know, the industry is presenting a vision of uh, efficiency and intensity and industrialization. And we're presenting this vision of systems change and agroecology. And um, I think it's a real challenge because this is such a loaded question uh, um, for governments. And I think one of the fu most fundamental asks is, and concerns is, you know, what are developing countries going to be expected to do if anything is framed in here? And you've got such massive commercial interests that are driving anything who are also worried. We don't want to see anything that would regulate us, right? That would regulate our methane emissions or our 
are nitrous oxide emissions. So whatever comes out of here should either be in our favor or shouldn't actually lead to anything. So that's why I think the issues are in limbo and uh, the UNFCCC has a lot of, you know, major issues that it's dealing with. And I think there's this feeling like if you add this in there on top of everything else, um, it's going to make it infinitely more challenging. That's not to say that we shouldn't be asking governments to be regulating these emissions and, and going after the, you know, these, the, the real source of these emissions, which is industrial agriculture. Um, but right now within the UNFCCC space, I'm not, I'm not confident that we would get an outcome that we would support out of that process at the moment. Mm. Thank you. Thanks for that, Shalis. Sobering, but um, probably quite realistic. Just very briefly, I think I want to add, you know, just as a journalist who's been covering these topics, there is definitely going to be a big food contingent at COP27 in a way that we haven't seen with the other previous COPs. But I would just to ask, request all journalists to give any announcements and pronouncements from there, you know, the same scrutiny as you would any press release, yeah? Please get them to go through, go beyond the jargon, get them to be specific. If they're saying we're going to solve this, we're going to, you know, sequester carbon from farm, whatever, just get them to give you the exact details and not just, you know, accept just the silver bullets uh, because it's 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 not it, it's it's impossible. It has to be a systemic change. And I think, you know, that's that's one thing that that I will that I will ask if you're if you're covering because it's. It, there's so much greenwashing and false narratives going on. Um, and, and, and I feel, you know, while it's, it's great that there's a big discussion around food and agriculture for this COP, I really fear that a lot of that is going to be smoke and mirrors uh, and, and, and just, you know, getting us confused. Um, Ching, um, I have a next question from a journalist in Northeast India. Uh, what can we do more to change the narrative and promote indigenous people's food systems as a solution as well? And how can we gain support and acknowledgement for traditional knowledge? Yeah, I think uh, thin, you addressed some of this in, in your interventions earlier. Um, you know, one thing, of course, is about highlighting solutions. And I think journalists can play an important role with that uh, to show that there are solutions on the ground. And we see, for example, in the biodiversity space, uh, sphere where I'm quite active, uh, you know, um, alongside official uh, UN uh, reports, uh, the Global Biodiversity Outlook, which assess the state of biodiversity of the world, um, uh, and what happens is that they also produce now a local biodiversity outlook done in by indigenous peoples, basically, that put all their stories together that show how they are acting. And we know that the science has borne this out. In the case of biodiversity, indigenous peoples, uh, uh, territories are where biodiversity flourishes and is greatest. And we can say the same for the agricultural sphere, where smallholders are practicing agroecology, uh, you know, that brings so many multi multifunctional benefits. And I think a lot of these stories can be highlighted. The second point, of course, is that we still need to confront power. We need to unmask the bad actors. We need to unmask the false solutions and expose them for what they really are. And I think journalists can also play a really critical role uh, in, in investigating this, in unmasking, and in pointing to the right solutions. Thanks. Thank you so much, um, Ching. That's really appreciated. Um, we have one question, and we're not really sure um, who might be the best to answer. Eddie, I wonder whether um, you'd be able to take this as a, a, a journalist, freelance journalist, asking whether um, how is climate change affecting the emergence and transmission of animal diseases? And what are the implications for livestock production and trade? Would you be able to take that up? Would you feel comfortable doing that? Uh, <clears throat> there was some noise in the background, if I can get the question again. <clears throat> Sorry. Sure, no problem. The question is asking whether how is climate change affecting the emergence and transmission of animal diseases and what are the implications for livestock production and trade? Um, the emerging uh, climate uh, related diseases and also escalating of the existing diseases, uh, especially here in the tropics, uh, where we have a lot of uh, new pests, new parasites, new um, uh, vectors coming up. 
but also uh, it's important to understand that uh, uh, trying to keep uh, the production system as clean as possible and less crowded uh, as possible and also uh, give uh, animals uh, a, a good welfare is one of the most important things in the livestock sector and also to focus on the preventive uh, uh, measures of livestock diseases. This is what most of uh, people who are incorporating livestock in other farming activities do and also it's one of the ways we can adapt to the uh, changing climate trying to keep um, uh, uh, the production system as free from crowding as as possible and also understand that uh, animals are an integral part of the uh, ecosystem out there, not uh, uh, part of the system that is confined in the small small rooms. So that is uh, uh, one thing I can say, but it's a true rea uh, reality, but also there are so many uh, uh, grassroots uh, based um, research uh, actions or so participatory research actions going on with farmers to find uh, solutions to overcome this challenge. Great. Thank you so much, Eddie. We are running out of time, but I'm very glad we managed to take a lot of questions. So what I'm going to do is actually ask um, all of our speakers to give their final thoughts. Um, Shafali, do you want to briefly answer the livestock question and also give your final thoughts? And then we'll go from there to, to, to Ching and then to Eddie. Is that okay? Sure. Thanks. Um, yeah, I mean, the emergence of I think climate change is actually impacting uh, um, intensification of pathogens, right? And we're starting to see viruses that were that we thought were eradicated that are coming back even and spreading in different places than they were. And when you have an industrial mass livestock production uh, system, which is um, basically its its essential feature is homogeneity and uh, weak genetic makeup on, and only genetically bred for the fastest production with the fastest weight gain, what you're going to have is a weak number and lots of animals in confined spaces. And combine that with climate change, with the emergence of pathogens, and also just climate shocks. I mean, we saw in Kansas massive amounts of livestock dead because of drought, sudden heat, intense heat, and they died. So what we actually need is a reemergence of the genetic variation there was in livestock, right? Again, it comes back to the same issue about diversity, about resilience, about moving away from the system that has been created to do one purpose, you know, mass production, genetic weakness, um, to actually creating robust, diverse genetic species that existed that have now been phased out. These need to be reintroduced again and appropriate to the locations where um, where they thrive. So that's on the livestock question. I think my one final comment would be, it is essential that we get regulation of the industrial agriculture sector. We need accountability. Everything is not gonna happen at the COP, but I think the real fight, if we're gonna, we're gonna make a systems change is to ensure that companies cannot greenwash their climate claims. So we need governance on climate claims, on greenwashing, on reporting emissions, on verifying whether these emissions are there. We need to know not just their CO2, but we need to know, you know what is the biggest meat company's uh, methane and nitrous oxide production and Cargill and all of these guys. I think the second thing is the risk can't just be thrust onto farmers and producers in the supply chain. They're the weakest link in the supply chain. And that's where the whole financing to support a transition to agroecology is essential. And, and when that movement is strong enough, then we can push for real radical change within the UNFCCC as well. Thanks. Great. Great. Thank you for those final thoughts. Ching, can I come to you next? Yeah, sure. Thanks. Um, and I'll, I'll just um, add on to what Shafali has already mentioned. I think it's absolutely critical also, and governments have a big role to play uh, in regulating, as, as uh, Shafali has mentioned. But I also think uh, we need to really look at the subsidies that are going to industrial agriculture. Um, because this, you know, there are trillions in perverse incentives uh, going to support really unsustainable systems. But we have to do this in a just and equitable way. We have to ensure that 
small producers in developing countries are able to continue producing that are supported that are supported to do biodiverse agroecology for example so we, we we need you know obviously this is a complex discussion that takes place at the wto but we do need to address it but we need to target them and do it properly and really pinpoint uh, and put the blame as um, someone mentioned earlier on industrial agriculture and say like no we can't continue subsidizing these uh, bad actors to do uh, practices that are wreaking havoc on the climate and on the environment. What we need to do is to support smallholders, support indigenous peoples, producers, those who are preserving biodiversity, those who are producing our food. Thanks. Thanks so much, Ching. Idi, can I have um, some final thoughts from you? Just quickly, uh, one thing I left out on the one, one thing I left out on the animal diseases is also to restore the indigenous breeds. They are very, very resilient uh, to climate and also diseases. Uh, uh, another thing uh, to, to conclude with, we need uh, uh, to uh, bring uh, uh, the attention to uh, funding and also uh, giving more and more cash uh, to the agroecological smallholder farmers because uh, this is uh, the, the way to go, and also to defund uh, industrial agriculture initiatives, especially in Africa and the global south, like uh, Agra in, in Africa. We need to campaign to defund this. This is disastrous to the future of food and agriculture on the on the planet. We need to shift uh, more resources to agri uh, agroecology and uh, uh, food sovereignty initiatives. Uh, smallholder farmers, and also more towards the people-centered uh, food systems, and listen. Uh, the COP should listen to the plight of the smallholder farmers and also to the demands we are putting across. Great, thank you very much, Idi. I guess two small points from me as well to journalists is one, look beyond carbon. Obviously, that's what we're talking about today. But, you know, look at other guesses like uh, other speakers have spoken, but also look at water, look at sustainability, look at economic livelihoods. Yeah, um, carbon is just one parameter, uh, just one metric. You need to look holistically. Second, I would argue that the media um, has engaged in too much of bold siderism when it came to climate change in the past. You know, we feel like we have to be objective or neutral and therefore we would ask a, a climate scientist to say something and then we would talk to somebody who says, oh, we're not really sure if climate change is happening or we're not really sure if humans are, you know, responsible. And, and, and personally, I think that really, really delayed a lot of climate action. Let's not make the same mistake again when it comes to transforming food systems. Let's not put both industrial agriculture and small scale independent agriculture at the same level. Do not let's not do both siderism again. Um, just very briefly to, I think, wrap up. Um, we've heard a lot of great examples, great ideas, um, how to cut through the noise and the greenwashing, you know, make sure the government um, are accountable, you know, ask about governance, ask about regulations, um, any changes, any announcement, look to see if we'll lead to just and equitable food systems, you know, beware of techno fix fixes, there are no silver bullets. Um, but also, instead of just talking about the negative aspects, I think there are a lot of positive solutions that we can also focus on, on the resilience, the diversity, what the small scale farmers are doing. And I think really, really important also to always remember um, as journalists, as we cover these stories, who benefits, who benefits from what is happening, who benefits from the current system. And therefore we need to highlight the people who are benefiting from a completely unequal, unsustainable, unhealthy system. And with that, thank you very much uh, to all of you for joining. Please reach out to either the teams at IPES Food or Growing Culture if you have any questions or concerns. Um, just very final uh, uh, information, um, IPES Food um, is, is the International Panel of Experts on Sustainable Food Systems. It's an independent panel of experts who are shaping debates on how to transition to sustainable food systems. Um, IPES Food is going to be at COP27. So if you're going to be there, 
do go and find them. They can help, you know, journalists with comments and interviews and, and, and analysis with leading food experts. Now, a growing culture actually works with hundreds of grassroots indigenous farmers and, you know, allied networks. So if you're a journalist and you're looking to incorporate indigenous knowledge and peasant and farmer perspectives, then you could approach them. They also have lots of information on agroecological solutions. So please reach out to them. If you have registered for this workshop, you will receive a recording and a resource toolkit um, uh, uh, in your email on how to cover food, climate, and COP27. Thank you very much for all of your work, interest, and passion on covering this issue. Um, I hope you have a great day, uh, regardless of where you are, and um, good luck. Thank you very much for joining us.